Circle centers for Cousins, a shot, and he scores. Dylan Cousins makes it 3-0 left Lethbridge. Byram going to take it coast to coast on a backhand, scores! To the blue line, Vandalies the effort, tip, scores! Carson Folk is Mr. Teddy Bear! A deflect! Yeah. He scores! It's over! It's over! Game 7! Overtime! Oh. Hero! Hi, hello, and welcome to the WHL Podcast. I am Zach Hodder, the Manager of Player Development for the Western Hockey League, and your host for this week's edition of the WHL Podcast. Well, there isn't exactly a ton of news and notes this week, so let me tease this episode. We've got two former Humanitarians of the Year, as well as two billet parents that also work together, as well as serve at, well, one of them serves as the team doctor for the Edmonton Oil Kings, and he won a World Junior Gold Medal last year as the team doctor for Team Canada overseas in Czech Republic. Quite an episode today, but again, before we get started, on to our news and note. The Tri-City Americans have signed their sixth round pick from the 2020 WHL Bantam Draft, Carter Savage, to a WHL standard player agreement. The six foot one defenseman spent last season with Delta Hockey Academy and was paired with Tri-City Americans first round pick, Lukas Trusevovich, for the majority of the season. In 30 games, he scored three goals and 12 assists and was named for the tournament all-star team at the WHL US Challenge Cup in February. And that is it for the news and note. Wasn't very much this week, but as always, you can follow all the going-ons of the Western Hockey League at whl.ca and on Twitter at the WHL. Aggressive forecheck paying off again. Towards the slot. Faust on the backhand. Gets it up. They score! The top scorer has done it. The Capitals take their first lead in this game. They're up 4-3. to three. Fantastic decision from Rudder to leave that one. Today I'm talking with former Swift Current Broncos captain Taylor Vaz. Taylor, how's your summer been? Uh, definitely an interesting one, I think, as uh, everyone is experiencing right now. After our season got canceled over here in Austria, uh, I made kind of the, in a way, tough decision to stick it out over here. Uh, there was so much craziness going on and I didn't really feel... I was putting myself in a, a much better position rushing back to Canada at the time, so... Uh, decided to spend the summer here in Vienna with my uh, Austrian fiance, actually. So we got some extra time together, which was which was awesome. And I, I think for everyone, it's a very unique and crazy summer that uh, we hope we don't have to experience again. But from that side, a lot of uh, summer uh, training workouts in my apartment here. So I was able to get some extra equipment from the gym for my team here and kind of uh, stay in shape that way. So it was a little different than usual but uh i survived it and stayed healthy through that and uh hoping to translate that into a good start to our season over here too so are you guys back on the ice with the capitals are you still waiting for the go-ahead on that we are yeah so the situation basically is that uh it can kind of change from day to day so in Austria here, we actually have kind of a red light, green light, yellow light situation where different parts of the country are in different statuses. And depending on where you are, you kind of have different rules. But as of right now, we're hoping to start the season on uh, September 25th would be for our, our league. And then we would open up on September 27th. So we're actually a bit of an international league. So we have teams in Hungary and Italy and Slovakia as well. So that just kind of complicates things where we're not necessarily within one border. So we're hoping that uh, all the teams are able to play and we're able to get started. And there's a lot of leagues that really aren't where we're at. So we're fortunate that we're getting going. And in general, we're kind of hoping that uh, all goes well to play hockey, but also do it in a safe way so that we're not, you know, part of the problem with the virus and stuff. So hoping that we can get playing, but hoping we can do it in the right way as well. Yeah, and speaking of playing, this is your fifth season with the Capitals. What what drew you to to take the opportunity to leave North America? You were playing in the AHL up and down in the coast. You know, what did you know about Vienna before you got there, and and what was the reason you decided to come over? So I had kind of gone up and down in my third season of pro there, going from the AHL to the ECHL, and. I was ready for a little bit more stability in the sense that there was just at any time I could be called up or sent down. And I dealt with that a lot that final year in North America. And I just kind of said, 
okay, let's see what, what's out there. Um, and my North American agent at the time connected me with my still agent over here in uh, Europe. He threw out a couple of options to me. I think the first contract offers I had were for the Dell 2 and I think I had some other uh, contract offers of different leagues, but just didn't really feel right initially. And, and making the jump, you're a little bit, not skeptical, but just kind of considering all your options. It's a big change. And uh, your lifestyle is going to change in a big way and you don't really know what you're getting yourself yourself into. So uh, initially the the contract that kind of popped out to me was a team in Italy called Bozen in German, but uh, Bolzano in, in Italian. So it's a little bit of a combination for languages there, not a lot of English. So that was quite an interesting transition. So I took that as just kind of a go over and see what happens. And if I have a good season, then hopefully jump to um, you know, jump up a step in salary and, and hopefully league wise and all those things. And, and uh, I, I had a good season. I was able to transition over into a, an organization that I felt uh, really excited about with Vienna and they were excited to have me as well. And we actually had an awesome first year. Um, we ended up winning the championship that year and really a year that I will never forget. And, you know, they, you always say it in championship year, you, you always have a great group of guys and we did, and that kind of transitioned into me loving Vienna. It's a beautiful city, and, and we've got great fans, a great rink and setup here, and uh, we live right next to the rink, which is pretty awesome. I can see it from my apartment. So uh, we've got a great setup in a great city, and, and for me, it's kind of become that second home where in my second season, I met my fiance, and, and that's uh, also uh, a pretty convenient factor for me where I'm able to play in the city where she's from, and, and uh, yeah. Coming back was a, a decision that just made sense. And uh, I think we have, we've got a good, uh, I guess you call it working relationship in the sense that I, I love being in Vienna and I think they enjoy having me as well. So going into this year, uh, I'm kind of becoming one of the older guys, which is kind of crazy. Uh, I still don't necessarily feel that way, but pretty cool that I can, uh, under the circumstances with less imports and on our team, uh, we got a lot of young guys. So hopefully I can, uh, you know, be a part of our, our growth from, from the bottom up. Well, you've been in a leadership position before. You were the captain of Swift Current Broncos your final year. You're also the 2012 WHL Humanitarian of the Year. You know, a, a big part of leadership is leading by example and doing what's right, which you've clearly done. But what motivated you to be so involved in the community outreach efforts in Swift Current that led you to win that award in 2012? Well, I, I think that comes from my family, coming from my parents, kind of uh, just instilling the importance of giving back and just being in a community like Swift Current, community-owned team and, and a small community as well, where that feeling of community, uh, that word is so prevalent uh, when, you, when you speak about a, a place like Swift Current. It, it's so important to bring that, uh, that feeling of community out in, in the city. And that's one of the great parts about a city like Swift Current. You make such great connections with the people around town. I mean, in, in a way, we're like little rock stars there. And in a bigger city, you might not get that. And big cities have their, have their own benefits. But from my experience, my grandma was actually uh, from Swift Current um, or lived in Swift Current. And my dad was born there and played for the Broncos as well. So for me, uh, that connection was pretty awesome to be the second generation and kind of share that with my dad. And I, I actually knew Swift Current before I ever was drafted or played for the team. So, uh, you know, Vienna is a second home now, but Swift Current was even before, before that a second home. And so to kind of give back to the community in that way was important to just uh, show my love for the city and uh, give back in a way that uh, hopefully made a difference and just kind of bring out uh, how special that community really was to me. Well, you have a new community now, Vienna. Your, your fiance is from there. You're going into your fifth season with the club. Are you still able to be involved in the community the way you were in Swift Current? Or are you finding it a little bit more difficult maybe with the language barrier? Or have you found a way or a cause that for yourself, you've been able to ingratiate yourself into the community through that? So it is a little bit tougher uh, with the language barrier. I, I am trying to learn German, so it's a slow, steady process with that. My fiance's uh, mother tongue is actually German, so she can be my best asset that way. But I did find that quite tough at the start because you, you don't really have the ability to have the connection with fans as much as you do back when you're playing junior and immediately can just have a conversation with someone right after the game or something like that. So uh, it was an adjustment that way, but... Going into my second year, I wanted to start giving back. And for me, the one of the big things for me is the type 1 diabetes awareness. And it was such a significant thing for me when I was first reached out to by 
couple of uh, NHL players and uh, Nick Boynton and Bobby Clark when I was first diagnosed and they just said, Hey, doesn't have to stop you from doing what you love. And, and if you want to play pro hockey or e even just to continue your junior career, it's not going to stop you from doing what you love. So that was huge for me. And I didn't want me being over here with the language barrier to change uh, the fact that I, you know, hopefully can be that person that uh, maybe a little kid can look up to. So I in initiated uh, an initiative called Taylor's Type Ones. Uh, and we started raising awareness over here through my team, the Vienna Capitals. And I actually designed a jersey for Christmas, Christmas jersey three years in a row. And we raised money toward diabetes kids camp, kids camps in Austria. For me, that was pretty cool because the one year, I guess it was after the first year, I went to one of the kids camps and was able to see really where that money was going. And just seeing these group of kids that were all dealing with the same thing and were able to come together and kind of say, hey, I'm not so different. Uh, you know, I've got other people that are dealing with this. And, and uh, it was pretty cool to see that. And uh, over those last three years there, we were able to raise some good money for those uh, camps. And, and uh, I haven't been as active the last little while, and especially with COVID and everything, it's a little harder to um, initiate those things. But I'm hoping uh, on some level that I'm able to keep that going and really raise that awareness and just show that, you know, diabetes doesn't have to stop you from doing what you love. That was a big thing that the NHL players said that still resonates with me. And if I can pass that on, then I'm happy to do that. Well, piggybacking off the last two answers you just gave, and it, you said, you know, you, you hope you left Swift Current a better place. And then also your graphic design with the jerseys you've designed. And the first jersey you ever designed was for the Swift Current Broncos, um, a jersey you actually got to wear the season you were the captain there, I believe. Where did you find the passion and when did you start to realize, hey, I have a knack for not only graphic design, but also for creating jerseys? I think up to this point, you've created 17 different game-worn jerseys that uh, the Prince George Cougars, the Colorado Eagles of the AHL, the uh, Swift Current Broncos and the Vienna Capitals have all worn. So where did that passion come from and how have you continued to develop? And I think you've turned it into a business called Full Stride Designs. That is correct. So the story behind that, uh, definitely um, the, the seed was planted with my mom. Uh, she's a very creative person and kind of uh, passed on the creative gene my way. And really the jersey design started when I was probably 9, 10, 11. And I used to draw my own jerseys and create my own logos and then hang them up on my, uh, my own bedroom door. And it's pretty cool as I transitioned into uh, Swift Current. And actually my first jersey was a breast cancer jersey my 19 year old year and I wore that uh, my 19 year old year and then the following year was the four Broncos Memorial jersey and especially to start off with those two jerseys that had you know major significance uh, with raising money for breast cancer awareness uh, my grandma had uh, breast cancer so that was you know special to me um, and then the four Broncos Memorial that jersey just has so much significance in Swift Current and if I could play any part in remembering those four those four players and and kind of celebrating their lives and and saying hey we we still remember and and we recognize uh, how important they are to the organization so it, again it started with my mom's creativity and and then transitioning me drawing and coloring my own jerseys and then actually my older sister got me a, a, a primitive version of Photoshop for my uh, birthday, or sorry, it was graduation present. So high school graduation. And I started fooling around with Photoshop when I was 17. And, and then uh, that kind of transitioned into the uh, breast cancer jersey and then the Four Broncos Memorial jersey. And it's just kind of taken off from there. So I've been fortunate that two of my big passions in life are hockey and design and to be able to combine those is pretty awesome. So uh, it seems that most of my uh, clients, you could say, are my former teams, and that's when you have the direct connections with, and I'm hoping to branch out, and I've been doing a little bit more of that recently. So uh, as time goes, I'm preparing myself for whenever uh, hockey comes to an end. I, I love hockey, I love playing, and I feel very fortunate to be playing professionally and living the dream of, you know, traveling the world and playing hockey while I do it. So uh, as I plan for life after hockey, design is definitely where I want to transition into. And that's what I'm trying to do with uh, full stride designs. And hopefully that keeps going.
Yeah. I mean, I would recommend anybody that's listening to the podcast, go check out Full Stride Designs. He's got all his jerseys up there, there. But, uh, you know, you're going into your fifth year here and you've been a very good player your whole pro career, especially since you've been to Vienna. And your coach right now is Dave Cameron, former NHL head coach and longtime NHL assistant. Um, What's it like playing for a guy like Dave Cameron who has that NHL experience? And how does that um, help your team as you guys prepare for a year like this? One of the one of the things for me was after my second season in Vienna, I was kind of figuring out contracts and stuff, and and I had heard through my um, through the organization that they were talking about bringing him in. And for me, it was important to have someone come in that really knew their stuff and had been at a high level. And so that was one of the you know there was many factors, but when you when you're talking about the hockey side of things, to have someone that's been at the highest level. Uh, in in the hockey world and and coach at that level it it brings a whole different uh, experience to the team and and for us uh, we can kind of translate that into you know for for him it was different as well because he's coming from North America coming from the NHL to a European style of game that is different and you know the reality is we aren't the NHL so there was that transition but right away we had we had some success in that first year Uh, we went to the finals with Dave and and uh, you know, he was definitely something uh, or a, a big part of why we were able to make that run that we had. And, and he continues to bring that experience to our team. And so big thing with that is just that experience and knowing, knowing that the guy's been at such a high level and, and you can kind of trust the hockey sense, knowing that uh, he's, he's really been there and done it. You know, Taylor, my last question for you is you've been part of the, the EBLE championship. You've been part of an American Hockey League championship team. And you look at your time in the Western Hockey League. Is there a memory or a moment that sticks out for you as your favorite, favorite moment or memory from the Western Hockey League? You know, when, when you ask that, there's a lot of memories that come, come to mind. Uh, it all kind of floods back in a way. But uh, one thing that was really special for me, and I think it was a culmination of my Whole time in Swift Currents. The last game, I mean, we we had a, a tough final year uh, in in Swift Current. We didn't make the playoffs, and we hadn't really had much success moving into the playoffs in the last couple of years. So I guess you're searching for kind of a different type of success at the end of the year. You know, where were your positives? And and I think one of the big things that for me at the end was hopefully creating a, a, a culture moving forward that make Swift Current and the Broncos be a place that you want to play and, and creating a kind of a, a culture within that dressing room that the, the guys that were maybe young with me were going to be um, good leaders in, in the future. And as I said, kind of that culmination, it all led to the second last game of the season, which was in Swift Current. And I scored a goal on the breakaway and it was kind of like the the last send off to my time and the fans and Swift Current and holds a special place in my heart because I made so many great connections there and, and lots of great friends and my, my billets were incredible. I still keep in touch with them. And as I said before, my, my grandma lived there for the majority of my career and she'd always come out after games and give me a great big hug. And I was so lucky to have those type of relationships. So uh, it was very emotional at the end. I remember, you know, basically balling my eyes out at the end of that game because it's end of an era and you don't know what the future holds, but I can look back on it now and be grateful for my time there. And that was a memory that always I'll, I'll always hold close to my heart just because uh, it was kind of the last send off scoring a final goal and being able to do it in front of the fans that supported me all throughout my career. And I still go back to Swift Current when I can. So things like that are definitely reasons why uh, the WHL, my time with Current and all those things were special, memorable, and all, all those different words that uh, just, you know, uh, I'll, I'll remember forever, for sure. It's a great memory to end off with your grandma there, giving you a hug at the end of the game. Well, Taylor, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. Best of luck this season and best of luck with your graphic design company as you continue on through not just your hockey career, but your professional career after. Thank you very much. Get away from Vaz, can't do so. Hedden, working that right half wall. Leaned on by Breen, plays to the side of the net, walking out front, unable to shoot Russell. There's a shot and they score, it's Vaz. This line of pests has scored to give the Stars their second lead of the night. Clear to center, knocked down by Roman. Pass to Ronning, onside, at the circle. Wants to shoot, he feeds, he scores! 
All right. I am here with the 2018 WHL Humanitarian of the Year. He's also set the Vancouver Giants single season goal scoring record with 61 goals. That is, of course, Ty Ronning. Ty, how's your summer been and what have you been up to? Hey, thanks for having me. It's going good. Uh, I'm just out here in Vancouver, uh, mostly staying home, training at home. I got a, a gym downstairs and just kind of getting after it and just trying to get better every day. So Ty, you're the 2018 Humanitarian of the Year, like I said. You grew up in the Lower Mainland. You got to play five years with the Vancouver Giants. Why was it important for you to get involved in the community the way that you did? Yeah, I think um, being with the Vancouver Giants organization, they, they've definitely preached on, on getting involved in the community. And, and um, I definitely couldn't have done it without their help uh, in certain ways. Um, you know, heavily involved with the Salvation Army, um, reading to children at schools. That was a platform that um, it's called the Read to Succeed program that the Vancouver Giants uh, implemented. Um, just a lot of different various things like that. Throughout that year, I find myself um, being somewhat involved in interacting with the fans. And I know some kind of have some social anxiety at times and, and, and um, some are going through some issues. And I felt uh, I kind of had the, uh, you know, uh, the means to help and, and communicate and, and help those in need and uh, bring smiles to people's faces when I can. And whether that's, you know, delivering a stick or a jacket or a jersey. I mean, you know, I, I definitely enjoy putting smiles on uh, people's faces. And um, yeah, it was definitely memorable. You actually did deliver a jacket to a young fan who reached out to you. And why do you think that's important? Mm -hmm. Why did you make the decision to say, hey, this guy reached out. And I'm not just going to send him a letter back. I'm actually going to go get him a jacket, sign the jacket, and then hand deliver the jacket to that player. I remember growing up, my father... Um, was was very similar in the way of of getting letters and and um, I got a letter that, uh, to me from a young fan uh, that didn't li live too far from my home in Burnaby, Vancouver. So yeah, just reading the letter and you know he kind of said the the things he was saying about going through some tough times and um, I felt compelled to kind of go and and uh, maybe deliver a jacket and um, say hi and you know so it kind of all started just throwing a puck in the crowd and kind of one thing leads to another and it just snowballs and um, I've definitely made some uh, cool friends over the years um, and a lot cheer me on and, and I have a great support group and, and I'm happy for it. Well now you've moved on to the um, the AHL team of the New York Rangers. Are you still able to be involved in the community in Hartford the same way that you were with the Giants? Yeah throughout the years with uh, Hartford Wolfpack um, we've done some programs going to schools. A musical class I've joined in on and, and talked about uh, perseverance um, even the past summers, I've been doing that here in Port Moody uh, School. And yeah, we also did uh, the Children's Hospital in Hartford. Um, they have a big hospital there and we got to go visit. Um, did that a couple of times actually throughout my years. And it's always nice to, to see those kids smile. And uh, I definitely enjoy it. You touched on this a little bit earlier, but your father obviously is Cliff Ronning, a longtime NHL player. And for yourself growing up in the Lower Mainland where Cliff was a, a cult star, a very popular player for the Canucks, what was it like for you where every single game you played pretty much your entire life, everybody's known who you are? Has it been, do you think, more difficult for you or a benefit to you to, to have that uh, almost label every time you step into a rink? Yeah, I've always had the last name running on my back. And I, I definitely, you, you, at times, you got some shoes to fill. I know my dad played 1,200 games in the National Hockey League. And uh, right now I got zero, but I'm still working at that goal. And uh, for me, it's, it's honestly, it's my own journey. And, and um, you know, I, I love the game of hockey. I, I play with passion and uh, I just love it so much. I've kind of, it's, it's in my blood, you know, growing up, it's always, it's been on the house, all, all and around the house. And I wouldn't say my father pushed me to play hockey. Uh, my mom actually put me in hockey first, but uh, having the name on my back, is just something that's always been there. And I haven't really kind of given it any thought other than going out and playing and lacing up my skates and enjoying the moment. Again, you just finished your second year of professional hockey. What's the transition mm -hmm. been like for you? You went from scoring 61 goals in the Western Hockey League to jumping to the American Hockey League. What's yeah. the biggest difference that you found from the pro game to the junior game? Yeah, I find, uh, I find the speed. Uh, thinking the game is a lot quicker, and it's a thinking man's game nowadays, and um, it's something that you got to have reactionary time to, to, to things that are happening on the ice. Um, you get a pass, you got to know where you're going to pass it to, whether you're going to shoot it or not. Um, you got to think uh, a couple steps ahead before you get that puck. 
and that's something that uh, definitely had to be turned up a notch going into pro hockey. And, you know, I, I still got uh, another year under my contract that uh, I got to go earn another one. So it's been, uh, it's been a grind, but I'm definitely understanding it more and more and becoming more experienced throughout that league. And I think uh, just all around for me, I'm excited to get after it and, and I'm itching to get back playing. As we look forward here, we, we don't know when hockey is going to come back. So let's take a look back on your Western League career. Did you have a favorite memory of your time with the Vancouver Giants? Probably, probably go back to uh, the top prospects game. I know that wasn't with the Giants, but um, definitely had to uh, come up as a call up. I wasn't supposed to be there. I was, uh, it was the top prospects game, Team Trey versus Team Orr, in the CHL. And it was in Vancouver at the uh, Pacific Coliseum. And uh, a player got, uh, injured and uh, they needed a call up and uh, I guess I was next up on that list so I really had no pressure going into that game um, we had a lot of scouts and, and about 15,000 fans in the seats and probably 5,000 of my of uh, people that I know around Vancouver and, and whatnot cheering me on so it was definitely intense and I just remember going out my first shift and uh, I put the puck in the back of the net and I just remember kind of celebrating looking up at uh, Mr. Pat Quinn's banner there in the stands and you know, I definitely felt like that was something for, for, uh, for him in a way. And, and um, that was a moment where I felt like, you know, I can, I can do this and I can belong and with, with these prospects, even though, you know, maybe I was um, cut in the first beginning. So it was, uh, you know, proving people wrong kind of moment. And that, that was definitely one that stuck with me. Ty, my last question for you here is, you know, it's switching gears a little bit, but um, you know, we look at the world today, there's, there's a lot of social unrest in, in the past several months. I've noticed that on, on your Twitter feed and on your social media channels that uh, you've had several posts, specifically um, some mentioning George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement. And my question mm -hmm. for you is, is, why do you think it's important for you to use your platform to discuss these social issues? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I know I only have a couple thousand followers. I don't have a million, but uh you know, I, I definitely feel um, in a way to stand up against injustice and um, amplify black voices. And that's where I'm kind of coming from there. And if me, you know, posting a picture is something I kind of am about um, and I stand for, then, you know, I, I'm there to do it. And um, I definitely uh, am behind them 100% in, in ways and, and uh, just been going about my business and, and um, yeah. That's great to hear because as a young person, you know, you're the, you're the next generation and in a few years, you're going to be a leader and an older guy on whichever team you're on. So to have that character and that, you know, a little bit of that courage to be able to right now put yourself out there and say, Hey, I'm willing to stand up for, for what's right and what's right for social justice. So kudos to you and best of luck. Thank you. I just think also it's just opening that conversation. I think people maybe don't want to have that conversation with one another. And, you know, for me, it's just kind of opening up that conversation, you know, so. So have you been able to have those conversations with your teammates? With my teammates, I have not. Um, I have not had those conversations, but seeing what players like Matt Dumba have done and, and Evander Kane and, and um, you know, Ryan Reeves and, um, you know, before the games, the NHL uh, playoffs going on, um, you can see them definitely acknowledging and uh, people understanding a little bit more um, about uh, the injustice. Yeah, I mean, it, the Hockey Diversity Alliance, which of course was co-founded by Matt Dumba, yeah. who just won the King Clancy. So, yeah. you know, it's a step in the right direction and we need more players like yourself to keep those dialogues going. So again, I Thank think you. I think you're headed on the right path. Wish you all the best of luck as this season is delayed as it starts. So, Hope your training goes well and that you're able to get back on the ice there with Hartford and get back into top shape right away. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dan. Ground by Calgary. Krebs won't clear it past Kosh. Watts finds Barbaras back on one and scores! Our final conversation on today's episode is with Ed and Teresa Berdusco. They are Bill Parents with the Edmonton Oil Kings. And now I need to set something up. I didn't do a very good job in our conversation. There's going to be a story that I asked Ed about, about a player getting hurt. That player is Damon Hunt from the Moose Jaw Warriors. In early December, he suffered a severe cut on his wrist during a game against the Edmonton Oil Kings. Ed was the team doctor, and that's what I asked him about. So when you get to that point of the story, now you got a little bit more of an understanding of what he's actually talking about. So without any further ado, do this is my conversation with Ed and Teresa Berdusco. It's 
You guys have quite the resume. Well, let's start with the with the most interesting part there. What's it like working with your spouse in the same, not just in the same profession, but in the same building? <laughs> <laughs> it's a really big department. Uh, we we very rarely actually work together, but when we do, we have fun. It's it's it's, it's good... the only time I have to listen to him. <laughs> I have. <laughs> Ed, you're uh, you're you work in the mostly emergency department. Yep. Yep. So for Teresa with COVID-19, I'm assuming that you're going to be dealing with that a lot more than what Ed would be dealing with that. What's it like being, being a nurse on the front lines of the pandemic? It's challenging, um, more so for time-wise. Like everything just takes longer. You have to gear up and gear down and you have to wash 10 times more so than we did before. And so um, it's, it's a lot. The challenge is the the time. But I mean, it's still, it's still nursing. I still take care of patients. I still have to, you know, from kids to old people to, it doesn't matter. It's all the same, but um, we're ready for it. We were, we were very well prepared. We watched it come across the globe. So we, we had a lot of simulation prior to it and we had a lot of practices and run throughs that we got to, to go through. So we were, we were well prepared. And then for you, Ed, in the emergency department, how is how has the COVID-19 affected your job at the hospital? Uh, it's essentially the same as what Teresa said. It, uh, when COVID started, our volumes in the emergency were down significantly because I think there was a perception that people didn't want to go to the emergency with because they could get COVID there. The numbers in Edmonton, as Teresa said, were very low. Now the numbers have certainly come back. And it's just, it's harder to practice because as Teresa said, we're taking longer. You have to put all your personal protective equipment on. Then you go and see the patient. Then you have to take all the personal protective equipment off. So it just, and, and you can't skip any steps because it's very important, obviously, when you're doing that to make sure that you do it as well as you can. So uh, it's just been, it's been a challenge with that. As Teresa also said, we were very prepared. We were, uh, we had some lead time coming into this of what was gonna or could happen. And we did a lot of simulations. We did practices. We did, you know, working together as a group, trying to make it so that we could provide the best care that we can. And uh, we were, we were well prepared. Just with your work, both of your work schedules, very time consuming. They're known for being very time consuming jobs. How did you get into building with the oil Kings? And you know, what, what was that experience like that first season compared to this past season? We started billeting in 2015. Uh, I've been with the team since 2008 as one of the assistant doctors and the team doctor didn't come back in 2015 and they asked me if I would step in in that role. So I took on the lead team physician in that role. We had been talking with the, the management of the Oil Kings, Brian Cheeseman and Randy Hanch at the time, uh, about doing a little bit more. And Teresa certainly said she, would, she wanted to, to have a, a billet son. And that's when it started. Uh, we had uh, our first billet was Ashton Sautner, and he was uh, just a fantastic uh, young man. And uh, we still keep in touch today. We went to his wedding. This year is, is obviously a little bit different. Um, the billet that we had left the Oil Kings. So it was, it was a little bit of a, a challenge with that. And then of course with COVID. Teresa, what's the experience been like for you as a billet mom? Um, oh, it's been, it's been great. I have no boys. It's the only way I was ever going to get a boy. And so I, I like being a mom. I like being, having a kid who the best thing that ever happened when we first got Ashton was very shortly thereafter, he came home and I wasn't home yet. And he's like, Hey, Ed, she's at home. And it's like, no, what can I help you with? And he's like, Oh, nothing. It's okay. And then like, I don't know, a while later I get home and Ashton's like, Hey, Trace, what's on my arm? And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know, ask Ed, like he's the dog, but you know, but he was just, he was so close to me that it was like, it was a bond that it's different. It's different being a mom to a hockey player than I think a dad to a hockey player. And yeah, and I love it. I, I, I do it again tomorrow. 
Ed, you got the chance to be part of Team Canada the past two World Juniors, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So this year it was in, it was overseas in the Czech Republic, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. What was that experience like for you getting to go over there to compete with Team Canada? But also it's different when you're working with the Oil Kings. You're with those players. Generally, they know who you are. You're around. With you coming into Team Canada and you're dealing with players like Lafreniere, Barrett Hayton, uh, you know, guys that are huge big time NHL stars in the future that you've never met before and then they get injured at this event what was that like for you as the team doctor having to deal with not just the the player but also the political side of uh, of what your role would have been there I'll take you back a little bit Hockey Canada does a fantastic job of getting you to know your players uh, and the the way they do that is I started with these guys at the U-17s. So I had them at U-17 and they were, I had uh, Team Black and Team White, but I had Team Red over the summer for them. So I had met all of them at U-17s. And then you stay with that cohort for the Ivan Holinka and for the World Under 18s as well. And then um, with them through the, the U8 or uh, the U20s. So some of these guys I've been at camps with for six or seven times. So I knew them pretty well. It's, it's always a challenge with the big stage that you have with the World Juniors. And nothing is ever, but even with that, nothing is ever, you're all alone. Like it's always a team decision. So it's a decision for uh, if it was for Laffy or Barrett, it's always a team decision where you involve the player, the parents, the agent, the NHL team, Hockey Canada, the athletic therapist that you were, that you were with. So um, Mike Bernstein was, was always one of the guys, you know, and Kyle Sutton, we'd talk about sort of what do you, what do you guys think and, and what did you see or was there anything that, they, they thought they wanted to say about it. So it was never just on my shoulders. It was always a, a shared decision. A unique circumstance to be traveling overseas to take part in that. As the doctor, how's that transition from, from North American medicine to, some would call it post-Soviet bloc, <laughs> Iron Curtain medicine in the Czech Republic? I, I didn't know what to expect when I was there, but the, the medical director at the games and the medical care that we received when we did need it, it was uh, world-class. It was top-notch. It was incredible. It was, I was really impressed. It was certainly North American standard. Uh, just the last thing here on the Damon Hunt injury, take yes. us through what happens in you, for you and the team when that, when Damon Hunt gets injured that night in Edmonton. So he got, um, it was just a, you know, a, a usual game. I couldn't see the injury because where it happened was just beyond um, the bench of his team. And I couldn't see it where it happened. But I saw something happen and I knew something was going on. So I looked at my athletic therapist and when I see something like that, I watch Brian Cheeseman to see what he is doing. Because if he jumps on the ice or if he immediately goes to the tunnel, I know something's going on. And, and I usually will just start getting down there. So I started to walk down to the, the tunnel and the athletic therapist for his team had, had him bandaged in their dressing room. And uh, there was a fair bit of blood uh, around. So I wanted to get a better look of it. So I actually took him to our dressing room to, to see what was going on. When I, took a look at what was going on. I knew that he would need surgery for the injury. We patched him up at that night. Uh, and then I sent him, I phoned a plastic surgeon and said, this is guy's going to need surgery. We got him seen by the plastic surgeries and then they booked him for a repair a couple of days later. Oh, I see yeah. Teresa saying something on the side. She, she did. So uh, she is because of our, <laughs> our <laughs> attachment with the Royal Alexander Hospital. It's very close to Roger's place. I phoned up and I asked Teresa to take Damon. No, I was at the game. I, I know. I, I phoned you in oh, your yeah. seats yeah. and phoned her and said, can you take him to the hospital for us? And she took him to the hospital. Really? <laughs> 
Well, he had, he had to keep pressure on his arm because it was bleeding quite a bit. And then, but the biggest thing is I can get into the hospital, triage, get him, get him a chart made and get him into a room and not take any, uh, like, um, what's the word? She saves the eMERGE, that person to do that. So we're not like, we're not like using their services, you know, cause we can do it ourselves. So yeah. I don't have to take another nurse and say, Hey, can you come do this? I just quickly do it and do it myself. And then we get it done. So it works really, it, it works, works really, really well. well. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing in the car, no blood in there. No, no, actually it was, um, who drove the mic? Mike, not Mike. Who's the equipment? The, uh, I not, don't know. not I don't Les, know. the other one. I don't know who took him that night. No, who's the other equipment guy? Not Les. Uh, not, not Rogan. Anyway. Anyways, well, someone else drove the truck and I held his, held his arm because it was actually bleeding through. So we just held pressure until we got there and then it was awful. Look at that. Family saving lives too. <laughs> <laughs> Winning gold medals and saving lives. No, it's just, it was a lot of that night. It was, um, you, you do the best you can with closing the wound and then you get them to, to see the plastic surgeon. So, cause you kind of know where they're headed. Yeah, you can, you can see. All right. Yeah. Well, again, thank you for taking time out on a Sunday to do this that everything for you guys stays as safe as it can be in your, in your jobs and in your lives. Take care. That's it. That's all for this week's episode of the WHL podcast. Thank you to all of our guests. And as always, you can follow me on Twitter at Zach Hodder. You can follow the WHL at the WHL. I hope that you have a terrific weekend, and I hope that you come back next week. We're going to be here Wednesday. We might even have a special guest next week. I don't want to put anything out there, but uh, former Western Hockey League player who's currently making a big impact uh, with the NHL in his new role. So look forward to that next week. Again, thank you, and have a great weekend.